uh, God ordained, I guess it was some early August that Adam showed up at a uh, at community worship center at Sandstone, a church that uh, he was raised in and for a reunion. And I had not seen him in years. And I met him there again, and his wife. Um, but the, where is she at? I think she took my son. She what? She took my son. Oh, oh, she did. Okay, my dad used to do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, his wife, Lima, is here. Right? Um, before I say anything else, I'm, I'm gonna, Adam and I met, and I said, "I'm not, I'm not going to feed your questions in advance." The Holy Spirit, He's got, He's got a story. Everybody has a story, and everybody should have a story. But he's got a story, and um, he's not coming because um, he's a superstar. Are you famous for anything? Not that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because he's an ordinary fellow with an extraordinary Jesus. But I'm not, you know, I'm going to ask you a question, right? Uh, when I came up to you and asked you to come and speak to us today, Adam, why did you say yes? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question because I I don't in, typically enjoy public speaking. But God just works so powerfully in my life, and I wasn't looking for Him. I wasn't looking for Christ. Um, and I just I'm a great sinner, and I have a great Savior. <coughs> and I was reading this morning Romans seven, wretched man that I am who will save me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ. I am just in awe of how gracious and merciful God is to, to me, to sinners. Uh, and I just can't, I can't stop talking about Jesus. So I can't stop sharing my testimony with people, um, pointing people to Christ. Can you turn Adam up even a little bit more, if it's possible, Scott? I talk kind of quietly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I that's what I like about him. It's the opposite of me. <laughs> we balance each other out there. Yeah, we balance yeah. each other out. It's great in a restaurant; they only hear one person. No. Yeah. Um, uh, now, before you begin, I'd like you to do two things. Now, you introduce your wife, okay? So yeah, this is my wife, Lima. Stand there, here you are. Good, amen. And and Austin is my son. Oh, he went to the kids' room. Okay, and your dad. And my dad is Jim in the front row there. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm going to ask you to pray before we begin. Mm -hmm. Well, dear heavenly Father, uh, God, you are so good to us. You have blessed each and every one of us in so many ways that we can't even begin to, to count the blessings, Lord. We just thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that, that you did it for us on the cross. You, you finished it. You're the founder and perfecter of our faith. God, we ask that you come now and uh, God, please guide the words that go out. God, just keep us from error. Lord, yes, yes. Uh, lead us into all the truth. And Lord, we, we just ask that whatever we say would be to your glory. Uh, we pray that, that we would decrease, that people would forget me and Sam and, and remember you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord. Uh, so we lift it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll ask you to challenge yourself to speak a little louder if you can. Oh, because of our hard of hearing people. This is not the first time that I've heard this. <laughs> I need to speak up. Okay. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, Adam, why don't you just begin and uh, wherever the Lord leads you about your background and whatever. Yeah, so as Sam said, I grew up in going to Community Worship Center up in Sandstone. Um, and for those of you, do you guys know where Sandstone is? Yeah. What is it, an hour and a half 
know where I'm from. So yeah, a small town boy, and uh, my dad and Sam were both pastors yeah. at the church I grew up in. And, and so me and my three brothers, we heard the gospel preached since we were babies. And we, we had just had a wonderful childhood. We, we were good kids. I mean, if there's such a good thing as a good person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got decent grades, we played sports, we were active. And uh, just, just a wonderful childhood. Growing up in the church, we went to a private Christian school. And we had a very strong foundation for biblical knowledge, right? Um, and that is a huge blessing uh, to grow up in a Christian home. Uh, it is, it's remarkable. And, and as a child, I said the sinner's prayer. Like a lot of kids, you say the sinner's prayer. I think I've said it many times. Um, but there was no fruit in my life. There was no deep conviction of sin. Uh, there was no deep stirring in my heart for the Lord. You really, at that point, you didn't recognize a need. You just knew it was a good thing to do. Or what? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it... It's hard to say what I felt. Mm. I guess, I, I think, you know, I thought, okay, you say this prayer, then you're good. Mm. Right? You, you say the prayer, stamp my ticket, now I'm going to heaven. Right? But there, there was, especially, I, I realized it more as I got into my teenage years. Um, just looking back, I could see that there was, I wanted sin. I didn't want God. Um, so, you know, there was, I don't believe I had a true and saving faith as a child. Just kind of going through the motions. And there was, so there was a change in my life in sixth grade. I switched from the private Christian school to the public school. And, and that was shocking for me, uh, just to see the way the kids acted, how they treated each other, how they treated their teachers, just general lack of respect. Um, it was like a culture shock for me. Uh, and then I, uh, another thing that I remember was just teachers started to challenge the biblical worldview, a few of them, especially science teachers. And I was not in a position, I was not ready to defend Christianity as a seventh grader. And it left me with a lot of doubts. And, of course, there was a lot of pressure around me from from the students, and I, I just wanted to fit in. And I, let me just say, I can't blame my environment for my own rebellion against God. You know, that it's it's not. I'm responsible for that, right? Good. But but the public school system didn't really help me. I don't I don't think. But after a couple of years, I started to act like them and talk like them, and I started to drink with them and smoke weed with them. I started to party even in middle school. I was I was partying. Um, as I got into my high school years, really the predominant pattern in my life was just waiting for the next time to drink. That's that's what I looked forward to was just drinking. And but from an outside perspective, from you know from societies. Uh, from a societal perspective, my life looked pretty good. I was a football player, I was in the band, uh, I got decent grades, and I even played on the worship team, uh, played guitar. Um, but yeah, there was, you know, I, I was in love with my son in high school. And so I went off into college, uh, went to St. Cloud State um, in 2004, and of course the, the partying just increased. Um, for me, and you know, halfway through my my freshman year, my parents got a divorce, and you know, I, I won't say too much about that. You know, I I love my parents so much; they're just wonderful. But you know, it, it was hard, hard for anyone, um, and and I, I held it together for a while, and then after a couple months, my my girlfriend broke up with me, and. And I don't know if it, it was just I was stuffing down all my emotions, but it, it seemed at that point that my life was just shattered. 
my heart was shattered, and I, I was just extremely broken at that point. It, it felt like my world had kind of imploded, um, and so I just dove deep to the bottom of a bottle of booze. I got drunk every day. I smoked weed every day. I got into cocaine and ecstasy. And I, I just wanted to be numb all the time. I didn't want to feel anything anymore. And so yeah, my life became very chaotic as, and, and fuzzy, as you might imagine. Um, and, and throughout my 20s, you know, I would go through phases of drug use, but I was always drinking. I, and I just, I never had an off switch. It was always one more drink, one more drink. And, and it never, it's never enough. Yeah. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't satisfy. It satisfies for a few hours, maybe. And in the end, it, you feel more empty. And so, you know, there's so much that happened between the ages of 18 and 32, but, but, I, but I also got into New Age teaching, um, you know, I, where I would, I would meditate sometimes for hours a day. I would do all these rituals. And, and for those of you don't, who don't know, with New Age, it's, it's kind of a mishmash of all these religions. They take elements of Buddhism, elements of Hinduism, they take verses from the Bible and twist them and make them into some make them say something that they don't say. But ultimately the goal with these this type of religion is to realize that you yourself are God. It is a it's a doctrine of demons. You shall be as God, knowing knowing good and evil. It's the same the same trick since the beginning. Um, and so yeah, there was you know, I, I, and I don't know why I, I got into that stuff, but I, I think one of the reasons that a religion, like if you want to call it a religion, like uh, one of the reasons it's appealing is because it allows you to, to cling to your sin. It promises you enlightenment, it promises you salvation, and you get to, you get to live your sinful life. Um, so I, I, got, I got deep into that, but there, my life was just a, a wild party throughout all this, and, and there were four times in my life when I went into a drug-induced state of psychosis. So the drugs literally made me lose my mind. Um, and this is, this is a hard thing to, to really describe. Um, it, it, when, when you're in a state like this, you have, you have moments of euphoria, you have moments of extreme paranoia. You know, I thought people were trying to kill me. And I, I thought my own family was trying to kill me. And it, it seems, each time it seemed as if there was a giant conspiracy surrounding my life. And each day I would go a little bit deeper into the conspiracy. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's hard to put into words. And, and there were there were times when I would I would see images of faces on the wall, I would hear voices. Did your uh, childhood or those experiences with God did did they ever come into your mind at that time, or were those just gone? You know your experiences as a boy and in the church. Yes, yes. And well, I don't think as a child I don't think I ever felt the presence of God. Right. But I mean, none of the memories of church attendance that didn't that didn't come to your mind while you're out there with all the new age. Did you think back at all, or were you just pursuing totally a whole new thing? Well, my mindset, and this is the mindset of a lot of people in the new age movement, is they they feel like Bible believing Christians they're they feel like they're stuck. Okay. That that the Bible believing Christians are the ones who are blind, okay. and so it's almost like yeah they're on the right track, but I'm much more enlightened than them. I know better. <laughs> right. Right. Um, no, and that, so that I think that was kind of my mindset. Right. Yeah. 
but you were progressing just fine. Spiritually. Yeah. And by the way, this is all man-made religion. Right. It glorifies man. Right. It's all works-based, and it's no different with the New Age. You do all these rituals, you do all these good things, and then you raise your vibrations. You know, man-made religion glorifies man, true religion glorifies God. Right. Right? It's all God who does it. Right. Jesus lived for us, he died for us, he rose for us. And ultimately we can't even repent and believe apart from the work of the Holy Spirit right. in our hearts. It's, in our hearts. It's, it's all the glory goes to God. Yes. Yes. So what happened, from, what happened from there? Um, so yeah, I can, maybe I'll just give you a general outline, you know, of, so you guys have an idea. Um, I was at St. Cloud State for a few years until 2008, and then I was up north for a couple years working as a cook. Then I went to massage therapy school in, in Minneapolis in 2010. Um, and I, I met my wife, Lima, in 2011. And we were married in 2014. And uh, Austin, our son, was born in, in 2016. And so most of the time when I was with Lima, I, I stayed away from drugs. And so as long as I would stay away from drugs, I would be, you know, I would be in my right mind. Um, but yeah, every time I would get into the, the drugs again, uh, after a few months, I would just lose it. So um, so I was drinking heavily the whole time I was with Lyme on. And Even if you were not on drugs, you you drank I drank heavily, yeah. And, and Lyme always told me if there was one thing that would break us up, it would be my drinking. Um, but in, in 2018, for whatever reason, decided to get back into drugs. And the whole summer of 2018 was a blur for me. I, I don't even remember it. Uh, Let me go back just a minute. Mm -hmm. So you ended up uh, uh, placed in psych wards and things like that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And that was when? Just an overview of that. Was it several times you told me? 2005, 2008, 2011, and mm -hmm. then stayed away from drugs until 2018. Mm -hmm. So there was that seven year period where I was fine and... Uh, were you were you still using alcohol in the... Okay, so the harder drugs or whatever, I call them hard, but... So you were still engaged in alcohol quite a bit, but not the other drugs. Right. So, okay, that's what I was just... So you were still using. Yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was not sober. Right. So yeah, in, in 2018, <coughs> at the end of the summer, I was completely out of my mind. And, and it, it is scary for the people around you. Um, you know, I remember Lyman telling me, when I looked at her, it wasn't me looking at her. Hmm. When I spoke, it was not my voice speaking. Like, hmm. I sounded different, I looked different. Obviously, I was acting different. You know, it, it was... There was really um, a demonic activity going on. I believe so, yeah. yeah. You believe so? She knows it. <laughs> and there's part of me that, I wish I had Lima sitting here, because <laughs> a great perspective is what you were feeling and what you were thinking during that time, and I haven't had a chance to visit with her. But, uh, yeah, so 2018, you had... Quite an experience, dark experience. Mm -hmm. And I would, I remember, I wouldn't sleep for days because I couldn't. Um, and that, and when you don't sleep for days on end, your thoughts just become more and more delusional. I remember at one point, very clearly, laying in bed awake, and I was, I heard a voice speaking to me in kind of a monotonous way. It was like I was listening to a radio talk and I, I had to listen really closely to even understand. But the voice told me, don't go to the church. The church is, is Satan is in the church and you can't trust them. Um, 
and at at that point, you know, I was very I was very suspicious of the church anyway. So I was like, yeah, that sounds right, you know. Um, but yeah, just some. It was clearly demonic, um, and so you know, eventually they put me in the hospital because right? I was I was out of my mind. Lima was scared for her. She was scared for our son, who was about one and a half. And, um, and so it's very hard for the people around, but it was very hard for me too, you know, because I truly thought that she wanted to hurt my son. You know, it, part of the paranoia, right? She obviously didn't. Um, but I truly thought she wanted to harm me and my son. And, and so it was a, a crushing uh, feeling for me. But, but yeah, eventually I, I was put in the hospital and, and they put me on just very heavy doses of medication, antipsychotics and uh, tranquilizers. And, uh, and, and I didn't want to take them. Uh, so for a long time, I, for a few days, I didn't take anything in there because I thought they were trying to kill me um, with medication. And, but eventually they, they were very persuasive and they, they convinced me. And, and so they let me out and my, my thinking became a little more rational. You know, very slow but rational. And, uh, and, but as I got out, I, still, I was still having horrifying experiences. I was still seeing images of faces. I was still hearing voices. And, it was interesting because Lima, right after I got out, she was, she was like, "I think we need to go to church." <laughs> and, uh, Lima, Lima had been involved with you in the New Age yep. spirituality stuff. Uh, you did not have a background at all in Christianity, right? Um, you can tell them where Lima was raised and what yeah. her nationality is. Yeah, so Lima grew up in Russia. And she was there until she was 11. She was raised by her, her mom and her grandparents. But you know, her grandparents were taught to be atheists in the Soviet Union. But they were Jewish? They're, they're Jewish, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're Jewish. So they were not religious. Of course, her, her mom would, would... There's a lot of spirituality over there. And her mom would take her to psychics and, and things like that. So she had that sort of new age type thinking since she was a child. Right. Um, she had no knowledge of scripture, but for whatever, for whatever Was that the reason, Soviet influence because they don't allow, okay, good, thank you. I should have had you here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> but it, it's astonishing that she, I mean, God obviously laid that on her heart. She's like, we've got to go to church. And I'm like, oh. Just out of the blue, <laughs> just out of the blue. Yeah. The very thing that you didn't like at all. Yeah. And now you've got your wife yeah. opposing you. <laughs> <laughs> well and, and yeah, I didn't I didn't want to go, but I, I wanted to keep my marriage. You know, I, yeah. I didn't want to lose my, my family. You know. And so I was willing to do do whatever. Um, but then yeah, so I think we, we may have gone to church a couple times and then there was one night when I woke up in the middle of the night and, and I heard voices just filling my house. Uh, and that is, that is the type of thing that just chills you to the bone. It, uh, this experience really hit me when you shared this, this particular time. Filling the house. It, yeah, well, that's the only way I could describe it. It seemed to fill everything in my house. It's, it, it like cut right through me and chilled me to the bone. And, it's like my blood turned to ice. Um, and my immediate instinct was to jump out of bed and chase it down the hall. And uh, I stopped myself you know, because I, I realized, okay, this is not a physical intruder in my home. You know, we have our alarm system on, no one broke in. And I realized at that point that this was, it was demonic. Uh, and it kind of, all these thoughts kind of hit me at once that I had opened myself up to spiritual darkness through the drug use, through the, the new age idolatry is what it is. 
And I had opened myself up to this. And I knew, of course, from my childhood that demons flee at the name of Jesus. And so I didn't want to just start yelling. My wife was fast asleep. And, and uh, she, you know, I was trying to prove to her at that point that I was not insane. So I didn't... I didn't want to wait. Didn't want to wait. Have you accomplished that yet? Well, still working at it. But I, I didn't want to wake her up and be like, "Honey, I think there's demons in the house." Yeah. <laughs> I would have woke up my wife. <laughs> You're very respectful. Yeah. But no, I just I, I I I don't know how to describe it. It, it is a terrifying thing, and and I just remember. Whispering to Jesus. That that intrigues me. So you you had been seeking other things and whatever it's called from self actualization to whatever yeah. the, that the old stuff. Um, but when this got its worst, that was your worst experience with those in the house, pretty much. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And at its worst, so you began to pray. Mm -hmm. You stayed in bed and you began to pray. Mm -hmm. and you prayed to Jesus mm -hmm. because how did you know demons have to flee in the name of Jesus well I uh, I, I think I've heard it several times <laughs> <laughs> growing up in the church <laughs> oh good answer <laughs> Okay. That's yeah, a great interviewer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to answer the way he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> well, you'll yeah, we'll pay more if you do. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so really, um, I don't know that a lot of people believe that. I mean, even in the church do not understand that demon activity is real. Right. Yeah. I mean, we think we've got some things in our mind, and, oh, it's negative thinking, or that kind of a thing, and it's a fabrication. I don't, also don't think we believe that angels are real either, though, in the way the Bible speaks. But the fact is, I think we think it's in your head, they're crazy, because the culture, you do need treatment, and that's fine. You need medication, yeah. that's fine. But so it's not real, it's just your messed up yeah. is the message. But you really knew that that wasn't in your mind only, that there was activity right. in your home. Mm -hmm. Do you believe yeah. that, that Lima? Yeah. And, and I think I would just say this you know, we've been raised in a culture for, for decades. They, said, they say you only believe in what you can observe with your five senses or, or what you can, yeah, what, what you can observe, really. Yeah. It's empirical evidence, right? That's, that's the only thing that exists. And it's a foolish worldview to say that nothing exists beyond what you can measure or observe. I, I'm, I'm going to interject, but I want to get back to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't want to go off on tangents. No, no, well, well, I do for a moment. Um, Adam, and I haven't listened to it yet, but, and, and you'll talk about this maybe a little bit at the end, but he not only shifted, I mean, God did something, but he's becoming an apologist and a well-written one for the scripture and the truth of the Bible. And he's got a podcast thing, and I'll give it to you later, I'll send it to you, and an e-book, but he, it's, it's just amazing because in all of your dark experiences, you didn't just get sort of straightened out that night. Something happened that has just, I, I can't wait. I might even have you come back to do a, a, a thing on, <laughs> how did you put it to me last night? You began to dive into the word like crazy. I mean, that was a thirst. And you said, it's impossible for the Bible not to be completely true. The evidence of everything. So, I'm looking forward to that. So, but, that night again on the 18th. Did you want to say something there? No. Okay. Um, on the 18th, yeah. We'll leave it at that. It's impossible that the Bible is not true. It's impossible <laughs> that the Bible is not true. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was I was terrified that night. It was a horrifying experience, and, and I just I just started whispering to Jesus to save just to save me. I was I was just crying, shaking in my bed, and I just prayed myself to sleep. And after that, the experiences just stopped. They were gone, and and I was astonished. But I was not I was not ready to surrender my life at that point. I you know I had been living such a crazy life, such a sinful life for so many years that it, I I needed I needed more, and I, I started to look for evidence. Uh, I love to research everything. So I started to look for evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, for, for creation, for a young earth, that sort of thing. But as scripture says, it's, it's not a lack of knowledge. It's not a lack of revelation. Everyone knows God. But we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We, we suppress the truth in our sin. And we exchange the truth about God for idols. So we are... In our natural state, we are self-deceived, and the true problem is a is a hardness of heart. But anyway, I remember one day in the fall of 2018, I was just in my kitchen listening to a debate between a pastor and an atheist, and I have no idea what the pastor said. I think he was quoting scripture, but I just I felt like my heart was pierced, and I was so convicted over my sin. And I was, I just knew the truth, that Jesus was the only way. Jesus is the only Savior. Jesus is God. And I, I completely surrendered my life to Christ. It was, and that was the difference. That was a couple, couple, that was a couple of weeks later, following the mm -hmm. and then when that went on. You don't remember the scriptures. No, I don't you know. You said you felt pierced. Isn't there a scripture like that? That the word of God pierces? <laughs> I think so. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that's what, I, just, yeah. what I've thought. I, I, I've thought about that several times. That God used his word to pierce my heart. And he still does. Mm -hmm. yeah. there. So the word is extremely, it's everything to you, is it? I mean, it's power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, with that pastor. So that, that night or that day, what took place then? You know, I, I don't remember the much about uh, the rest of the day, but there was like a switch that flipped on in me, and, and all of a sudden I couldn't get enough of the Word of God. I was just devouring Scripture. I was constantly praying, and I would listen to sermon after sermon after sermon, and I was just in tears, just broken over my sin. And my I started to hate all of the, the sin in my life, the intoxication, the perversion, the sexual immorality, everything, I was disgusted by it. And, and my only desire was for Christ. I just wanted Christ. And you know, what's amazing, there's a lot of amazing things about that. Right? But in 2011, my mom had given me a Bible, and she wrote in there, May the Lord grant you an unquenchable thirst for Him and for His work. And it was exactly seven years later when I was saved, to the day, because she wrote the date in there. I know why. And exactly seven years later, He gave me an unquenchable thirst for. for that was that same day. You're talking about that date that that you watched the debate, and mm -hmm. suddenly, is that when you like made a surrender? Or something. I can't remember the word you used. I surrendered my life to Christ. Out of that debate, and that was two weeks after this heavy demonic activity. Something and like that. Two weeks later. So two weeks later, you're in a place of absolutely a total turnaround. Mm -hmm. Just not just okay, I'm better, but hungry, starving for the Word of God. Yes. Yeah. Nope. It's not, it wasn't just like, okay, I'm just going to give the church thing a try. It was, mm -hmm. it was like, I'm, you know, and I, I, I said this so many times, God, I'm, I'm yours. Mm -hmm. All of me. 
everything about my life. Do, do with me what you will. Right? And I think it is all God, right? It wasn't like, oh, I, I was really, I made the right decision. <laughs> there was enough goodness in me. No. It, God shined his light into my heart and he showed me my own wretchedness. And in, in a way, that's a terrifying thing, but it's just a wonderful thing. Because when God does that to you, He's drawing you to Himself. Right? Something just, and I'm just trying, I'm really trying to track. Because I think it's critical. What you just said, seeing your wretchedness, what? I think our, our culture and our church culture is in the place of almost unwillingly or whatever doing the opposite. Making everybody feel somewhat good or more comfortable or okay or acceptable or something. Self-help. Self-help in the church. Yeah. I'm not talking about the world. Um, so if, you know, I don't want to I don't want somebody to feel so bad to see that you're you're impossible, you're apostate, you're a wreck without God. You have nothing to bring to the table. You don't even have a table, right? Yeah. So well, no. So so when you're you're saying something that is so important, because we're not seeing enough transformed lives. We are seeing people constantly that are a little better today, a little better tomorrow, but not transform lives. And the secret is not in me trying to, let's say, build them up, but God exposing, right, the Holy Spirit exposing where they are and what they need. That you can't be dependent on God partially. You know, it's like, you're relatively good, Sam. In fact, I don't think we're much different than a lot of inmates that my wife worked with, which are, you find your value in comparing with somebody else. This, you know, this guy's a worse criminal than I am, the ones in the institution. And so I think we kind of measure how well, how well we're doing as a Christian by, oh, at least I'm not doing that as opposed to having come to a place. You know, we got rid of altars in so many ways. Come to a place of absolute <coughs> repentance, which is only possible if you see how bankrupt you are. Yeah. And that would, I think, we just... I don't know, Adam. So you were... It was not in a church, but you began to pray in your home. And then you're watching this program, a debate, and you don't remember the scriptures, but you know the word of God pierced you. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, you saw that you were stripped. Yeah. Yeah. Naked before God. Right. And then you think about the miracles that Jesus did. You know, he was not just showing off, right? Mm -hmm. Heals the leper, mm -hmm. the lame walk, the blind see. The deaf hear. That I think that is what happens to us spiritually. Right? That I that I was a leper. Right? I was lame, unable to walk with Christ. I couldn't see. I was deaf. I was a beggar. That's what happened happens to every believer. Every everyone who God regenerates. So and, and you yeah. might you might not even realize that's what's happened to you, right? <laughs> yeah. So go on from there. So yeah, I, I I was just devouring scripture, and and God was just working so powerfully in me. But for a few months, I still had these horrific cravings for alcohol. I I uh, I hadn't drank at all, but. For any, anyone who's experienced addiction, you know it's it's almost it's it's all your your control, 
just, I didn't want to drink, but I wanted to drink. <laughs> uh, and it, it was just horrible cravings. And there was one day in the spring of 2019 where I was just so sick of it. And I just started to beg God for about 20 minutes, just begging Him to take away my desire, my cravings for alcohol. And I finished the prayer, and I, I didn't expect anything to happen. Oh, ye of little faith. And, but after a few days, I realized I didn't have a single crate. And to this day, it's just gone. God took it in an instant. I want to say something that will probably be controversial. At least, you know, it might be. We're not negating how God has used treatment programs and celebrate recovery. Okay. But the idea that a program is more powerful than Jesus Christ. You said God took it away. You were not involved in a treatment program. Well, I, I, I did actually go to a treatment yeah. program, but it, it, I mean, in one thing I will say. At that time, did you go? I, I went to outpatient treatment. Yeah, okay. Program. And the one thing I will say is they, the woman there got me to admit that I had a drinking problem, so that was that was probably something. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but, no. I mean, the, that type of treatment is not what took away my cravings for alcohol. And I can tell you that all the other people in there were just clinging to the table, doing everything they could not to drink. Mm -hmm. But you actually had no more cravings? Nothing? It was just gone. And you haven't had any since? No. I don't, I don't want it. Why? Because God took it away. But it almost seemed, when you were speaking to me, that you had a thirst for everything but God. Yeah. The real God, the God of the Bible. You had a thirst for spirituality, you had a thirst for drugs, sexual immorality, addictions. You had a thirst. You told me, I think last night, that nothing could fill. I mean, there was no filling you up. You just kept going. Yep. And on that given day, two weeks after the 18th, it wasn't like the thirst for that was diminished. It reversed. And you had a thirst for God. Right. A thirst for the Bible. A thirst for truth. My thirst was redirected. Totally. So you still had a thirst. Yeah. <laughs> You're addicted now, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we all crave peace. We all crave satisfaction. We all crave joy. Yeah. Everyone wants those things. Right. And we look for them in all the wrong places. I, I do have an evangelist friend, and he, he does not hold back saying, go ahead and accuse me. Every, everybody's got an addiction. I'm addicted to Jesus. I can't live without him. I, I can't go do my day without him. And, and, and that is kind of offensive to some people. But the truth of it is, it's not, it, it's, when I hear him speak, that it, it really hits, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You need a hunger and you need a thirst. And you need to constantly be seeking that in Jesus. So you, you began to do that. What else? The, you begin to have that yeah. going on. Did you, did you ever, do you still hate church? Do I hate church? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's, it's just the opposite. I, I, you know, it, yeah. it just love, I love being around Christians. So you yeah. did, but you were not interested in church before. No. Isn't that? No, not a lot of church. Lima directs at you. Yeah, Lima is like, yeah. She yeah. usually directs me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but let me ask this question, though. Why is the church important to you, then? Because God worked in your living room, and you prayed the name of Jesus, and you got into the Word. And so, what, on what level is the church important to you? And no, this is not a setup. I never asked him. This <laughs> I didn't ask him. That's no, I didn't. Uh, well, the church is, is the body of Christ, right? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Mm. 
we we need each other. We we can't do we can't follow Christ on our own. Right? Um, and each of us is blessed by God in a unique way. Right? We need the church and the church needs us. Um, that's right. right. Maybe you've heard the it's, it's like you take one burning coal and take it out of the the pile of coals and it goes out. Right? Throw it back in and it lights up again. You know, we, we need each other. And, and Jesus designed it that way. Right? And, and this, yeah, is how, right. this is how we grow. Right? We are being knit together in, in one body. Now you did make some really, you made a strong statement and I I won't remember it exactly. Your view of the church is not, how did you put it? The church is not supposed to be just trying to seek to get people in numbers. Uh, you talked about a little leaven, leaven of the, in other words, would you explain? You said the church's purpose is not to be popular and just gain people. You called it a business model. Right. Well, what do you mean by that? Explain that to me. Well, and, and yeah, everyone's like, who's this new guy critiquing church, right? <laughs> um, no, but I think what's laid out in Scripture is not that we get as many people into the church as possible so they can hear the gospel. Right? The church is for saints, for redeemed sinners, to fellowship, to worship the true and living God, and to be equipped to go out and dis make disciples, right? That's what we're here to do. So, um, Adam said to me, the church should not be focused on numbers because if you're just trying to get numbers, you're going to get a watered-down church. You're going to get a church that is not... Um, and, and we're not talking about immature people. You're talking people redeemed and we're growing. But you said what really should be going on is the church is there to build the body up to go out and reach the lost. Not to see just don't mishear me. Not to see just how many lost we can get in. But rather to get out to reach them where they're at. Right? Right. And I am not opposed to inviting your friends to church. No, no, you know? no. And having people come that don't know Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you're saying if the church, if it becomes comfortable without change, and people are just brought in, and there's not change, then the, the little leaven thing is what you mentioned to me. And I don't know exactly what you're saying. That's what I'm asking. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think we were talking about 1 Corinthians 5. And, and the Apostle Paul talks about how when there's sin within the church, with unrepentant sin, and it, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, he, he says to purge the evildoer from among you. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's, of course, church discipline laid out in Scripture, how that's, you know, it's, it's not like you just say, oh, you're a sinner, you're out of here. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, no, but but yeah, there there is there's certain guidelines that God has laid down for church discipline and how we go about that. And we we talked about accountability yeah. and about judging. And Adam said something, and and I've really gotten in trouble. Don't judge me. Everybody says don't judge me <laughs> all the time. It's the favorite line. <laughs> and and you had brought up first, and I thought, wow, finally somebody. Had, we are as believers to judge one another. We are to judge with righteous judgment. With righteous judgment. It's called accountability, but it's, it's more than that. It, Paul says if we don't judge the body rightly, it will get destroyed. If you, we don't judge one rightly, the world will end up judging us, is what Paul says. But we, we're not judging non-believers, but we... And judge sounds such like a tough word. But man, if I have a brother that will let me go on, some of the worst times of my life is because I wasn't challenged. Mm -hmm. 
I wasn't challenged. A parent will absolutely judge their children. <laughs> if the kid says, don't judge me, you say, hey, wait, shut up, I'm the parent here. Don't, but, <laughs> but, you know, you see your parent doing things, getting into the world, or you believe their grades are failing, and you judge some things. It's like something has changed in their life. And again, but you judge. It's a loving judgment to say, I can't watch you go this way. Whereas we often in the church, it's like love ignores sin. Love ignores somebody that's failing. Don't do that. Joy and I have said, I don't want a doctor that says it'll be okay. Well, and I'll just add, yeah. I think we need to have a right view of the law of God, right? We're, of course, not under law. We're under grace, but we are, we are saved to be obedient. Yeah. Which, to most of us in the West, sounds really weird. <laughs> we're saved. We're free to obey, right? Um, but when God's commandments are not burdensome. When God says, you shall not do this, he says, don't hurt yourself. Exactly. When he says, you shall do this, he's saying, help yourself. <laughs> so you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So he says, help yourself. Love me. See, do you, do you notice the, 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 the commandments that seem negative? You're saying, and by the way, I like something in the New Testament, the way somebody put it, when the law is written on the heart, not on the wall, it becomes, it's not, thou shalt not steal. You better not. It's thou shalt not steal when it's in your heart. You won't. You won't want to. Yeah. You, you won't be able to do it. In fact, you mentioned that you cannot help but speak the things that God has done for you. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you, so now, I said, so where are you really at? What's kind of a, a summary? What, what is it that you're about now? Who are you now? What are you doing now? Yeah, so... For the past few years, I, I really dove deep into scripture, into apologetics, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and what I, is apologetics? Oh, apologetics is the defense of, of the Christian faith. From, in the Greek, it's apologia, a reasoned defense. And so I just, I love to, maybe I have an unhealthy appetite for debate, I guess, but, <laughs> if I, but no, I, I think... You know, we are to correct our opponents with gentleness, right? But we, you know, and we're not to be quarrelsome, arguing for the sake of arguing, but we are called to debate in, in a loving way. We're um, defenders of the faith. We're supposed, we're all called to defend the faith. And, and, you know, like you said before, there was a certain point when I, I realized that everything is impossible unless you start with God. Existence itself the very law-like universe that we live in. There are laws of physics, laws of mathematics, laws of nature, laws of logic, and all of this comes from God. God is the God of order, not a God of chaos. Right? Yes. He is creator and sustainer of the universe, carrying the universe along to its intended destination. You know, none of that makes any sense if we are the result of a cosmic explosion. So again, uh, and that's on, that's on your blog. Yeah. Was I cutting you off? Or you no, no. And, and I, I was just, you know, what I've been doing is just diving deep into stuff like that, and and I was really struck by messianic prophecy, and you know, early on in my walk seeing, in the Old Testament, seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, and I was, I remember just being in tears, reading Psalm twenty-two. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm. And, and just, I'm not going to take you through the whole chapter, but, you know, yeah. they pierced my hands and my feet. Right? Written, what, a thousand years before Jesus was born. And that's how And you could, I could go on for probably two hours about Messianic prophecy, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'd probably stay, but I'd be the only one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Me and Sam will stay. <laughs> um, so you're now about, um, you're doing what? There's, there's, yeah. I know that you're affiliated or something with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but, but you use the word evangelism, and, and give me the context. 
Yeah, so, and I, you know, after studying so deeply and God just working in me so powerfully, what God impressed on me was just the urgency of the gospel message. I, I realized at a certain point that all of Scripture is breathed out by God. And of course, I was saved before that, but at a certain point, I was like, this is, this is breathed out by God. And what, what are the implications of that? that? The people that I meet every day, apart from Christ, are going to spend an eternity in hell. Did you hear the word he used? In hell. Right. There's a hell. Yeah. There's a heaven. Yeah. And I think you used the phrase, the urgency of the gospel. What does that mean to you? What are, what are you doing about that? Well, yeah, I, I think God impressed on me this urgency, and I just couldn't stop sharing the gospel with people. I just I just started to pray for opportunities, and, and yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? And some people are very upset with you, and, and they call you names, but... But what? I mean, what is that in comparison to eternity? Right. I mean, the, so just God started to give me this eternal perspective, right? And this life is just a blip, right? And then, then comes eternity. Yep. And so uh, I just I pray for opportunities, and, and, and it's not because I'm good, but it's because God has just worked so powerfully. And so that's we need more of that. And I don't I don't get a megaphone or anything and stand on the street, but uh, yeah, I just maybe uh, maybe we should try that. Yeah, well, some of you want to meet afterwards on yeah. the street. <laughs> we go to Taco Bell a lot right after church. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so what is what is a closing thought? If you were going to say, I want to leave everybody here with one thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that might change every time you're speaking. It might be, yeah. but what would be the one thing you want to people to take away when they leave here? Yeah, the biggest, I think the, one of the most important lessons I've learned in my life is there's nothing in all of creation that can fill you, that can satisfy you. Uh, I have tried to fill myself for so many years with booze and drugs and women it, it doesn't satisfy. It's a lie that it satisfies. The more you try to fill yourself with, with things that are not God, the emptier you become. And it's like, like God says to Israel in Jeremiah 2, your fathers walked after emptiness and became empty. That's what sin is. That's what idolatry is. The true joy is found in the Lord. Um, in his presence there is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And, and maybe you're, you're like I was when I was a kid. You just you don't feel anything. You understand the concepts. But you, don't, you don't feel the passion. You don't feel the presence of God. God says, you will, search, you will seek for me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Um, there's a couple of things that have <clears throat> impressed me. Number one, you ended up hating the things you used to love in terms of sin. You hated those things. And you began to love the things that you were not at all interested in. And it was a total reversal. The other thing, and, and I honestly believe that and when you said there's a lot of people, and you're you're one of them, and I was one that you can you can grow up in church and you can say all the words and even have a certain sincerity to that, and still not see your sin before God and be repentant and recognize your need. You can sit in the church and never have seen who you are apart from God because you've just gradually evolved into looking like a Christian or even feeling like one at times. I think there's nothing more dangerous than um, the, and a weapon for Satan is to have people that 
feel good about themselves or feel better about themselves with never having felt awful before God and hopeless without God. If you haven't reached the place of I am wicked apart from God, then you don't know the transforming power of God. And so that, seeing who you are and seeing God for who he is, um, that is huge. That is when a church can really come alive and have the fire of God in it. Transformation. Not assimilation. I'm not just <clears throat> fitting in. You know, um, there seems to be something else. I was going to ask this. Lima had... I mean, if you would have heard the words born again or anything like that or being saved, that would not have meant much. You you said you'd go to church. But, so, I'm assuming that you're a believer today. I, I think he said that. <laughs> what? How, how, why? Um, yeah, I can share. I think for me, it was seeing the change that God did in Adam. You know, um, I couldn't change him. The birth of our son. He didn't talk about the birth of our son, but it was a traumatic birth. You know, he's heavy, he, healthy. He's a miracle child, but that didn't change him. And um, when we were going through everything, I just had this thought. You know, like we need to go to church. I've never been to church. Um, and the way everything worked out, I I knew I didn't do it. It was just miraculous. You know, we got help from Adam's family, and so grateful for that. <laughs> but. Um, it just the way he changed. It wasn't any. It wasn't anybody. I knew it was God. Um, so I didn't have that biblical knowledge or anything. I can't even say the exact moment when I was like, "Yes, I'm saved." Um, but yeah, he transferred all the things I used to believe four years ago are totally different right now. You know, he has been working on my heart and growing me in my faith. But yeah, I think it was just seeing that seeing that radical change in Saginaw and my husband, and I knew it wasn't anybody. It was God. It was just evident. To it me. would have been impossible. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Good. Do you have anything else to say? I do. <laughs> uh, I, I, re I really would, would really like to have you together because you're one flesh, and um, I think you heard what it is—a miracle. She saw a miracle of a transformed life in her home. And that brought her to God. Now, what does that say to you folks about people who are watching you? Right. Are they watching a transformed life? Because if they are... Do you have anything else? Because I get ready to close here. Oh, don't ask. I would have gone for hours. <laughs> Like I said, I may have you come back on that apologetic because wouldn't you like about a 45 minute course on apologetics for the scripture? You know, the Bible being true. Um, so I, I will just I'll say this. Um, it's, it's gone way too fast. And like I said, I will send people your blog. You put certain people's testimonies on there. Mm -hmm. And then you have your apologetics and I, I haven't done much with that recently yeah. because I'm I am working with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Right. So right. I'm a busy guy. But but, but um, and and next week and so I'll just kind of close. We, we usually do together time starting at about ten after eleven. But this has been really good, don't you think? Yeah. Would you like to thank Adam this morning for? Well, let's, let's close. I'm so glad you were here for this.